there's a tension between the service, the ISPs, the network service providers, the internet service providers, and the people who run the big services like Google, like um, you know Amazon and these large providers, iPlayer, BBC iPlayer, for example, where the people who provide the services, who provide the, the content, need the network in order to deliver the content to their customers. Um, the network providers are the ones that have to pay, in some sense, for the delivery of that content. That's what their business is based around. And so they would like to be able to say, if a particular service starts getting very popular, so suddenly YouTube gets very popular and it hadn't been previously, they might like to be able to say, well, we could charge more for that traffic because it's in demand, and that means we can make more money out of this. Um, whereas, obviously, the people who provide the content would rather they didn't do that because they don't want to have to pay more for that. So this kind of debate is this tension about, around, can you get more, can you essentially, can you extract more value as a network provider from doing what you do? The internet originally was for interconnecting the different networks that were de developed, I think, mostly in the US at the time, so like the military network, the ARPA network, and so on, these were all interconnected. And it's grown out of that into having lots of networks connecting, so you now have commercial networks that interconnect into that. Um, there is a rough notion of hierarchy in the internet in terms of the type of network and size of network, but it's fairly ad hoc and it's sort of evol evolving over time as well. So it used to be the case that you had quite a clear core network, so you'd have I think, if I remember right, there were about sort of five to ten of these. And these were networks that fully connected to each other. And then from these, you would have other networks. These networks were the tier one. And then you had other networks that would be slightly smaller, what were called tier two, rather unimaginatively. And then you'd have the sort of, you'd, you'd kind of grow out from that to have the smaller and smaller networks. And so the idea was that if you ended up down here at your house, and a packet got injected into this network. This network might not contain the destination that packet was trying to get to, but what it would do is it would connect to other networks and it could then transit this data so it came out to the server that you wanted to get to. And it's that interconnection of networks is what the internet is, essentially. So if you're in this tier one, it probably means that you've got direct peering links with all the other networks in tier one. And that'll be, to, that'll be based on a business relationship with those networks and an agreement that you've come to about how much traffic you carry, how much traffic they carry, how many people you can reach, how many people they can reach. And so you come to agreement that you're both willing to exchange traffic freely. If you're in a low, in a sort of a higher tier, so in tier two rather than tier one, then you're probably going to be a customer of one of those networks. And so you'll have a different type of arrangement in place for paying for data transit, for data to be carried, for example. Um, so it's not really a, it's not a technical, but you're still running the similar protocols, right? You're still carrying IP packets just like everybody else is carrying IP packets. It's just that you've now got this different business relationship. Is this tier one spread across the globe? Or? Oh, yeah, yeah. So I draw the diagrams like this as if these are connected, these are sort of singly connected blobs. But in practice, these are going to be geographically spread around the whole planet. So actually, there's a kind of overlaying of multiple networks sort of geographically on top of each other, almost, that then interconnect at certain points. So one of these networks might be Sprint's network, for example, and they will have points of presence where they have routers that you can connect to in many, many cities in the US and around the rest of the world as well. And there will be multiple points of contact. So although, again, I've drawn it with a single line here, actually there's going to be multiple places where these different networks connect. And it's going to be, it's going to be much more complex than this rather abstracted picture I've put here. They're going to be physically overlapping and they're going to be touching at multiple points. Let's take a fictional streaming service, Loveflix or Netfilm. Suddenly the technology, sorry, more importantly, the content arrives in 4K, super high definition, yeah. and they decide that they're going to broadcast or stream this in 4K. How will that play out then? So that you're, I'm, I'm Loveflix or Netfilm. Netfil I think Netfilm is probably safer. For <laughs> Loveflix. Yeah, yeah, Loveflix is a bit scary actually, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so I'm Netfilm and I want to be able to give my customers this super new service. You will have some arrangement with the network providers that your equipment sits in their network or sits connected to their network, and you'll be paying them some amount of money for delivering your traffic. And so there's potentially going to be an impact that suddenly you're now going to much higher resolution, which means you need more bandwidth to deliver it, which means it's more traffic, which means you're going to end up paying a lot more potentially for that. And then it, depending on how that is structured, there may be different kinds of agreements in place in terms of how that pricing works out, essentially. Um, in terms of the customer uh, kind of experience of that, Ideally, what you would like is you would like to have that data fairly close to you, the server physically close to you so that it doesn't take too long, so that you can essentially get higher, you can get lower latency connecting to it. 
um, and you can potentially get higher bandwidth depending on the, how the rest of the network is, is configured. So, so let's say this is NetFilm. Everybody from all around the planet has to try and come in, get data from that server. Obviously there's going to be a whole set of servers here, it's not just going to be one, but they might also choose to put those servers in different places. So both different places geographically in the same network so that there's going to be one in the UK so you can get the stuff from that. If you're based in the UK, it's going to be something in the US so you can get something from there. But also connecting through different networks. So they might also choose to put some servers in this other network so that the customers of that network will have something close to them in network terms as well. And the reason for doing that then is that you will often basically pay for moving traffic when it goes between two networks. But if you're a customer of this network here, then it's probably going to be cheaper to have the traffic do that than it is going to be to have the traffic come in through all these other networks to get to you. Because there's less arrangements in place and this provider is able to manage that better. So they'll both want to geographically distribute the service and they'll also potentially want to distribute it into particular networks where there are a large community of users that are using it. If they can move some of their content, drop it in to that network, then it means you get a better performance and it's cheaper for them because they don't have to pay so many, they don't have to pay for so much delivery of traffic. So at the moment, the customer is paying for which part of this and, and which bit is NetFilm paying for? You'll have money flowing this way because the customer's got to pay for their link. You'll have money flowing this way because the customer's paying for NetFilm. And then you'll also have money flowing from NetFilm, I believe, into the ISP networks. And you'll have money flowing perhaps not between the tier ones because they'll probably have some kind of peering arrangement where they two, par two parties will decide that if the ratio of traffic in and out is about the same or within certain bounds, no money needs to exchange hands because it's a benefit to both sides. But you will have money flowing that way from the network provider into their network. So there's quite a lot of stuff going on there. And the benefit then for NetFilm of being able to put the server into one of these networks is that it cuts out some of the money that has to change hands and the benefit for the network provider is that it means that the, because the, the data is going to originate from within their network, they don't have to pay anybody else for transiting it. And it potentially reduces the load they've got on their, in their network. So often the links that are inside the network will be higher capacity comparatively. And it's often these links that go between networks which are lower capacity, or at least whether that's for technical reasons or simply because you've got to pay for what goes across those links. And so there's a sort of benefit to both sides that NetFilm get their data closer to the users so it's easier for the user to get a good experience and there's benefit to the network provider because they don't have as much data having to transit the expensive links. We'd like to thank Audible.com for sponsoring this computer file video. They've got loads of books online for you to choose from. If you want to try one out for free, go to audible.com slash computerfile. I asked Dr. Richard Mortier, who featured in this video for a recommendation, and he recommended Boneland by Alan Garner. It's narrated as well by Robert Powell, which is fantastic. So get over to audible.com, maybe try out Boneland on uh, Dr. Mortier's recommendation. Try out a book for free at audible.com slash computerfile. Thanks once again to them for sponsoring this computerfile video. And so what's going to happen is you've got some data that starts out in your browser. So it's, that's the request. And then that's going to get sent down through these libraries eventually into the operating system. And what's going to happen there is that this chunk, which is your original data, maybe is going to get encoded as a TCP segment. 